that immortal monster that you are. You piece of trash. Immortal hunters await. Are nothing there. Mm. All you have to do is become mine. We start our adventure at a school of magic. For some reason Negi, a tiny red-headed man with a strange high-pitched voice appears to be a very popular professor. Don't know why dude sounds as weird as he looks. But for some insane reason the girls and fellow teachers seem to love it. Dude sneezes and the power of his sneeze strips them. Okay, we are off to an interesting start. We then spot a blonde beauty spying on them. Okay, Miss Voyeur. She is Evangeline A.K. McDowell. We realize it's just a flashback cause she's a 700-year-old vampire. As she narrates we hear that she views her immortality as a curse. Okay interview with a vampire. We fast forward 80 years into the future. Evangeline now goes by Yukaheim, blonde woman, English accent with a Japanese name. Makes sense. Also she's aged, which is weird because she's immortal. She's now a college professor. As she walks to work, a group of students, Toda and his friends, try to ambush Yukiheim. They plan on assaulting her, but as they jump out from the tree, an invisible force field stops them in their tracks. She laughs at their audacity and punches them into a puddle, Kale. Back in the classroom, she punishes them again with torturous methods while reminding them that the only way to the capital is through her. Chiki Toda asks her just what kind of barrier she used to block them, but she doesn't respond. The boys suspect magic, but Yukihime still doesn't answer. Background info, Yukiheim is Toda Kono's foster mom and disciplines him as such. Spicy lady. After school, Toda and his crew talk about their teacher's magical abilities. Apparently, people started openly using magic 10 years ago. There's even an app that allows normies to use magic, but it's outrageously expensive. Toda's life's goal is to defeat Yukiheim so that he can go to the capital and climb an enormous tower called the Orbital Elevator. The boys chat some more than Toda rushes off to visit his parents' graves. Apparently they gained their angel wings in a car crash two years ago. Yukiheim has been raising him ever since. At the graveyard we see three graves, his parents and a third with the name Negi Springfield. There's some emo background info and we see phases of the past two years. Then as Toda is about to leave an apparition of the freaky ginger professor appears and tells him he's waiting for him on the tower. Then it disappears. Call Ghostbusters bro. At dinner that evening, Toda begs Yukiheim to teach him magic, but she still refuses. Instead she tells him to study harder. The next morning, Toda and his crew attempt another assault upon Yukiheim. Of course they fail, she reminds them that they'll never beat her. The boys are depressed and hopeless until one of their professors, Mr. Tachibana, pops up. Dude is SUS but offers to help them. He buys them a magic app and teaches them how to defeat Yukiheim. Unfortunately, Toda is a boomer when it comes to technology, so it won't work. Mr. Tachibana apologizes saying sorry lil bro, but you don't have the magic touch. He cheers him up by saying he has another trick up his sleeve. A bracelet that he's to give Yukiheim as a gift. Men using jewelry to scam women, an old trick. Back home, Toda is unsure how to give the bracelet. When she walks through the door, he cringingly says it's for her. It gets awkward and he runs away embarrassed, like the titty baby he is. Yukiheim accepts his gift and wears it. She goes shopping and as she leaves the store, Toda's crew suddenly appear behind her using teleportation magic. They ambush her and bind her using vines, happy to finally defeat her. Yukiheim is impressed and maybe even proud. That's when Mr. Tachibana pops up again and we see what his real intentions are. He beats the students, knocking them out and then impales Yukiheim using several conjured spears. That's gotta hurt. She tries to activate her magic, but the bracelet blocks it. Tachibana admits to being a bounty hunter who wants to delete her and claim the bounty on her head. Yukiheim tries to struggle but the vines and spears make it impossible. Tachibana raises his sword and walks towards her. In the nick of time, Toda arrives to block him. He shouts at Tachibana asking what the heck is good, but Tachibana attacks him with super speed and hacks his left arm off. Red foam sprays. Jesus is Lord. Tachibana is about to behead Toda, 
when Yukiheim somehow blocks him even though she is still bound. Her love for Tota and her need to protect him broke the bracelet's binding spell. Tachibana loses his mind and starts hacking her into pieces. It's a red foam party, y'all. Tota being a titty baby screams out in anguish, but Tachibana, ever the villain, just runs his sword right through him. That's a dramatic twist if I've ever seen one. Tachibana walks over to the rest of the students to ninja fruit them too. Tota is about to give up when Yukiheim's severed head calls out to him. Surprise She quickly tells him the reason he's not game over is because he is special. Yeah, it's really special. Apparently, she made him an immortal monster when she rescued him two years ago. She says it's now or never for him to activate the power inside him. But the only way to do this is to drink her red foam that's splattered all over the place. Nice. Tota chooses and starts to lick the spattered red foam like it's cake batter on a mixing spoon. It empowers him to move again, and with one arm he confronts Tachibana just before he fruit ninjas his homies. They charge each other and the battle is on. Tachibana is stronger though, and knocks Tota down. But Tachibana and I are rudely surprised when Tota's hacked off arm decides to join the party and reattach. Somehow this powers him up and he power punches Tachibana into the next galaxy well, actually into somebody's van, chest concave. The stress of the battle and everything he has experienced makes him go night-night. Just before heading to Dreamland, he sees a young girl walk over saying thanks. He comes to lying on Yukiheim's lap. The smell resuscitates him. She looks down at him lovingly then reveals her true identity. Her coin purse is 700 years old. She tells him his parents' last wish was for her to save him. And even though she regrets it now, she gave him her immortality curse. Tota is overjoyed that now he won't ever lose the game of life. It's no curse to him. Little bro wants to spend the rest of forever with Yukiheim. Simping ain't easy. Time passes and Yukiheim and Tota leave for the capital. With a bounty on her head, it's no longer safe. Tota greets his crew and says they'll always be homies and to come to the tower to chill sometime. Yukiheim asks him about his tower obsession, but little homie lies to her face and quotes Biggie saying it was all a dream he read about in Word Up magazine. As they walk, Tota remarks about the abandoned landscape. Apparently, this is a worldwide phenomenon. So much so that the capital is now called New Tokyo. Tota also asks why they are walking so freaking far as the capital is miles away. Yukiheim reminds him that they are being hunted, doofus, and it may not be wise to play red foam fruit ninja all over the place. But happy-go-lucky Tota is just excited to fulfill his tower obsession and meet new homies. They rest and Tota decides to skinny dip in a nearby lake. As he floats with the current, he bumps head first into something soft and squishy. He gives it an extra squeeze to figure out what the heck he is grabbing on and it's a tushy. His victim is angered and power swipes him out of the water. Surprised Tota is excited and shouts you're a woman. They punch him into next Tuesday and deny being female. Okay Browski. Tota apologizes for assuming their gender and they become acquainted. Browski introduces themselves as Karamaru Tokasaka. He admits that Tota has impressed him as no one their age had ever dodged his attacks before. Karamaru explains that they come from the tower and are heading to the capital. This leaves Tota super stoked as this must mean Karamaru is a richy rich. Chill, gold digger. Karamaru sadly says he has been banished by his family. He cannot return until he finds a 700-year-old grandma named Evangeline and Molly Wops her. That sounds familiar. As Karamaru talks, he realizes that Tota has no reflection. Oopsie. Stupidly Tota calls Yukiheim over. Karamaru immediately realizes that she is his target. He pounces and charges at her with his sword, which she blocks. Yukiheim recognizes Karamaru as one of her long-lost foes, the Shinmai Ryu. Tota is Confucius. So Karamaru explains that his clan, the Fushigari, hunt immortals. He informs Tota that he knows he's a baby vamp too. Tota immediately gets sad as he was hoping they could be homies. Karamark powers up and attempts to attack Yukiheim with a secret technique, but she foams him and takes him out with a hand through the chest. Tota is terrified that Yukiheim just committed a code 187 and starts to freak out. Yukiheim tells him to calm his tittes and take a closer look. Tota checks the enthusiastic immortal hunter and is shocked that his wound is already healing. Surprise! 
Karamaru is also immortal. Then Toda does something deviant which immediately wakes Karamaru. Karamaru declares he must slay Evangeline. Only then will the banishment be lifted. So clever Yukiheim challenges Karamaru that she will battle him if he can defeat Toda. Challenge accepted, with no consent from Toda. The unwilling battle begins with Karamaru conjuring Toda a sword to battle with. Toda has a single condition to start. The loser must grant the winner whatever they want. That sounds fishy. But as the fight proceeds, it's obvious that they are an equal match. Until Karamaru beheads Toda, thinking the fight is his, till Slick Toda grabs his falling head and squishes it back onto his neck. What the hell? Then he power punches Karamaru through the ground. After winning the battle Toda is frightened, he may have excommunicated Karamaru's soul. But Karamaru stands up and accepts defeat. Toda makes his demand known. They need to be besties. Bromance initiated. Blood oath taken. To seal the deal they head to the public nude baths. Deviant behavior suspected. Karamaru shares some of his past. Apparently his immortality is the reason for his banishment. Toda invites him to join his crew but Karamaru is super emo. To cheer him up, Toda suggests they climb up a cliff and spy on the women's bath. Deviant behavior confirmed. Toda wants to get a peek of Yuki Haim's rocking bod. Apparently this is what all men do when hanging out. Perversion. Karamaru denies his request because it's pervy and he does not want to get on the bad side of one of the deadliest vampires alive. But this excites Toda even more. So he speeds up the cliff alone, splashes into the bath and spots a very young girl by herself. Toda knows he's seen her before and she reveals herself to be Yukiheim. Apparently Yukiheim uses an aging spell to age herself into the woman he knows. With her rocking bod back she teases Toda but he is totally put off after seeing her lolly body. He calls her a fat-chested baby which angers Yukiheim immensely, so she attacks Toda with several forms of ancient magic. Her ice spear attack caused him to fall off the cliff. Speedily Karamaru rushed to save the falling Toda. After a quick save Karamaru realizes that was pointless as Toda is of course immortal. After another deviant semi-non-consensual escapade, the three continue their journey to the capital together. Toda comes up with a brilliant idea of finding other immortals and ganging up for the greater good. Yukiheim starts giggling and says someone she knew back in the day said the same thing. But before she can finish her sentence, several cars pull up. Yakuza style. The passengers step out and kneel before Yukiheim. A spicy woman named Karen tries to jump Toda for no good reason. Yukiheim warns her that he's one of them. Yuki explains to Toda that she already made an immortal organization known as Yudak Holder. Weird name, but okay. They board a yacht that takes them to the capital. On board, Karen, being a typical Karen, wonders why Yukiheim gave her red foam to Toda's weird imbecile behind. Yukiheim warns Karen that Toda is just as strong as she is so watch your mouth girly. Karen crushes the cup she's holding at this surprise revelation. They arrive at the Palace of the Immortals. Tin clicks off New Tokyo's shore. It's a hot springs resort by day and a secret headquarters at night. The UQ holders line up and are overjoyed by Yukiheim's return. While watching this Toda and Karamaru are approached by UQ holder number 6, Jengoro Makabe and number 10, Iku Ameya. They share the knowledge that not all immortals are vampires. Some are magical or beast people, some use magical items, and a few have uploaded their consciousness like Black Mirror. Wild organization. Makabe says before the boys can join them, they have to undergo a test. This test will be a duel. If they can get hit by any UQ holders, they are made immediate members. They boys can fight dirty or fair. Just then entitled Karen pops up and invites herself to fight Toda while Makabe will fight Karamaru. Toda springs into action, but Karen pops him in the temple with her weird-looking golf club thingy. Next up Karamaru tries to fight Makabe. But he avoids his slashes so easily, it's kinda embarrassing. Makabe doesn't use magic, just intuition and battle experience. Exhausting Karamaru in no time. After their failed attempts, the pair sit and do a play-by-play. -play. During this, a maid carrying a heavy load trips on a stone and falls in front of them. They rush to help her and offer to throw the trash away for her. They chat with the maid and share that they want to join the UQ holders. Introductions are exchanged, and we learn the girl's name is Shinobu Yuki. Back to Yukiheim. 
She's in her office contemplating how her past and present are intertwined. Tota's grandpa once had to face a similar test. Now it's Tota's turn. Meanwhile, Tota and Karamurv continue to help Shinobu. They head to a storeroom carrying heavy boxes. A voice calls out to them and leads them to some underground basement area as they try to figure out their location. A drunk guy is chilling and introduces himself as UQ holder number two, Jinbei Shishido. Our crew is flabbergasted, thinking drunk Jinbei must be super powerful to be the number two. Jinbei points at a sword stuck in a cement block. He tells Tota to pull the sword out. Apparently the sword was forged by some overpowered dark mage with an Italian name. Many powerful men have tried and failed to pull out the sword. On Tota's first attempt he fails but then, a voice in his head tells him just what to do. An open sesame the sword is in his hand. Stunned, Jinbei's like how the heck you do that Browski. Tota is quick to share that he hears voices. I would have kept that a secret, but I guess that's just me. Turns out the sword has a name, Kurobo, and it's gotten bored and lonely from being locked in the basement. After pulling out, Jinbei informs Tota that the sword has several powerful functions that he needs to learn, like a gravity option that can make it extremely heavy or light as a feather. If Tota can master it, it is a powerful ally to have. Tota and Karamaru will remain in the basement to train with the sword and improve their battle technique. Days pass and the boys have improved immensely. On the last day of the test, the boys rechallenge their opponents. Karamaru challenges Makabe first and Tota takes on Karen. Makabe tells Karamaru that he sees improvements, but he doesn't fight dirty enough to win. Makabe starts slapping Karamaru all over the place. Suddenly, Karamaru is inspired by what Tota thought. He gets a flash of inspiration and allows Makabe to slash off his arm. Makabe thinks it's all over, but that's when he is pierced from behind by Karamaru's severed arm. Checkmate. Makabe falls over, and above his body, a display screen appears showing that he has lost a life. From 255 to 254, Makabe rises, congratulates Karamaru, and comments that he hasn't lost a life in ages. Karamaru is now a UQ holder. Back to Tota's battle with Karen and things are heating up. Shinobu watches from a distance playing as a cheerleader. Behind her an enormous ugly beast is sneaking up getting ready to chow down. Tota is fighting like a champ, and with some quick moves he knocks Karen to the ground and holds his sword to her neck. Before he can land the winning blow we hear Shinobu screech in the distance. He immediately runs towards Shinobu. She is surrounded by terrible monsters whose saliva is made of acid. As Tota is about to attack from above, Karen pops up and offers some help. She distracts the monsters, enabling Tota to save Shinobu. They head to the roof. Now Karen is surrounded by drooling red-eyed freaks who look like they want to put her on a white couch. Makabe and Karamaru rush over, just as Tota turns the dial on his sword to 500,000 and jumps down into the group of monsters, destroying them all. The blast of his sword leaves a huge red foam splatter and an enormous crater in the ground. As the sun sets, Karen admits that Tota bested her and can join the UQ holders. Yukiheim still questions how the monsters emerged from under the resort. She figures that the two who were training in the basement may have something to do with it, so she sends them both back to excommunicate the rest of the monsters. She also sends Jean Bay to join them as punishment for getting into her liquor cabinet. Yukiheim summons the new UQ holders to her office. They're going on a mission with Karen as their supervisor. This is our crew's first mission, and they are stoked. Tota is most excited thinking he'll be driving in a Yakuza-style vehicle, but no such luck. Our crew and Karen are in running mode. Karen fills us in as she runs. The wealthy are eliminating the poors. These classist fascists don't believe poors should exist. Luckily, UQ holders won't allow it. They arrive at a hill above the church base. Tota jumps down and knocks out all the surrounding men, not realizing they are part of his team. Smarty. Our crew stays with the poors for several days and Tota is put in charge of the cooking and cleaning. He's an excellent chef and even my mouth is watering. Everyone compliments him including the guys he knocked out and even Karen. Poor Tota questions if he's their savior or their chef. After lunch, Karen informs Tota about a secret technique called Fash Step and says he should practice it. He wastes no time and immediately starts training. While practicing, some random dude pops up and power punches Tota like he owes him money. Ouch. 
He immediately starts babying Toda and insulting his attempts. He points out the dust clouds as examples of Toda's failure. Mr. Random then gives Toda a YouTube tutorial on what it's supposed to look like. Dude is a pro and makes no sound and leaves no dust. Super impressive. He explains that this technique will definitely improve Toda's fighting and arm wrestling skills. At first Toda thinks it's some vague nonsense, but after a swift kick and a few more demonstrations of grabbing the earth as Mr. Random calls it, Toda is convinced. Finally the martial artist introduces himself. His name is Kaido. Kaido sees that Toda is talented and takes him under his wing. There are two maneuvers needed to be a fast step pro. Once Toda has mastered the first, the second will come easy. Kaido even offers to be his sensei if Toda succeeds. We see Toda's initial training, and it seems he has to do everything by foot. And I mean everything. Days pass and Kaido continues to train Toda. Later we spot Kaido walking to meet some other bros. An old blind dude named Nagumo and a pervy dude named Shinzi Chao. Nagumo senses Kaido's happiness and asks him what's good. Kaido tells him all about training Toda, but Nagumo immediately warns him to not get attached to their impending victims. They are the baddies sent to eliminate the poors. United Nations, is that you? Kaido says not to worry and immediately transforms into a giant werewolf. The trio are immortal hunters and they head down to the slum to eradicate all. We head back to the slum and see two UQ holders get assassinated in a red foam spraying kind of way. Their attackers look like goblin midgets, not a pretty sight. While her men are being executed, Karen is unaware and taking a shower. Then a portal opens beneath her and that perv dude, Xingzi Chao, throws several bullets but she blocks them intuitively. She manages to disarm him and shoots back. Unfortunately, Chao doesn't seem too bothered. He attacks her and they fight like cats and dogs. Chao is vicious and psycho but Karen gives as good as she gets. Just when she has him pinned, he uses his portal technique and pulls another weapon out. He shoves it quickly in her mouth and fresh off several rounds. Diabolical. Chao has figured out that even though she's immortal her pain receptors work just fine. The sadist enjoys hurting her. Arrogantly Chao gives us a bit of a backstory. He is part of a private military called Powerful Hand. Their job is to delay the immortals while the slum gets burned to ashes. Chao keeps blabbing while he slowly tortures Karen. Dude has a black hand technique that reminds me of the plunderers all thing, which he uses to pin her, then he pulls out an electric knife to stab and electrify her simultaneously. Jesus Christ. The gremlins show up and Chao reveals that he is a shadow using mage. Chao is obsessed with Karen and knows all about her history. He sadistically continues torturing while whispering sweet nothings to her until she power kicks him in the teeth. Thank God. He was getting on my nerves. Karen floats above him shining bright like a diamond. She is powered by the Almighty. Chao is flabbergasted as vampires should not have God's power. But Karen is quick to show him that she is divinely blessed. Not cursed as humans and perverse freaks like him want to believe. She then gives him a holy beatdown, and it's a thing of beauty. Back to Toda who's helping a slum kid collect trash. Together they see that the slums are on fire. The goblin midgets are Molotov cocktails every shack they see. Toda wants to rush back and help but the goblin midgets have found them and are about to attack them too when Kuramaru pops up and slashes those little gremlins sending them flying. He gives Toda a quick update and as they start to make a plan more of those ugly little gremlins show up. Kuramaru says they are mind-controlled puppets. Then the white wolf and Nagumo arrive. Toda tells the slum boy to run for his life while they battle these intruders. The white wolf immediately figures that Toda is a vamp and attacks him with a powerful crucifixion spell that takes him out the game. Kuramaru is left alone to fight. Kuramaru is lip syncing for his life. The wolf is a pro martial artist and the blind swordsman is gifted beyond Kuramaru's abilities. But Kuramaru holds his own. Just then the wolf, using a flash step, pops up beside them and pounds Kuramaru into the ground. Kuramaru upper half goes flying in one direction and the bottom half in another. He sees that the crucifixion seal has almost excommunicated Toda who lies unconscious nearby. To make it extra spicy the wolf throws iron pillars through Kuramaru's lungs and is about to add ice when the little slum boy, Rookie jumps in and blocks the attempted attack. Kuramaru screams at Rookie to run for his life. But the little boy is brave. 
The wolf grabs Rookie and compliments his bravery, but says he'll still have to eliminate him. The blind swordsman explains. They've been hired by the wealthy living at the top of the tower, who still claim the land as their own. So the poors have gotta go. That's capitalism. The wolf is about to slap Rookie into his next life when Karamaru somehow pulls the pillars out his back and fips the remaining half of his body over to Rookie. The dust clears with Rookie and Karamaru's arms, but someone else is blocking the wolf. It's Tota. Everyone's flabber are gassed. Especially when they spot his full body, his arms are glowing black and red. Vu te f. Nagumo asks Tota just what the heck he is. But the wolf doesn't care to know and charges him. Tota Pimp slaps the heck out of Wolf like it's nothing. Nagumo is worried, but Wolf is overjoyed. Finally, a worthy opponent. Tota teases Kuramaru about his missing bottom, but also warns him to get them out of there. Then Karen pops up and says not to worry, she'll handle Billy Blind Man while Tota makes a new fur coat. Tota tells Wolf that he knows he is Kaido as his fast step ability is unmatched. So Wolf returns to his human form. Kaido is an obsessed freak and can't wait to fight. They charge forward and Tota is better than Kaido expected. They are fast stepping and fast punching each other to shreds. They pause and Kaido begs Tota to be his apprentice. Nah, no thanks bro. Finally Kaido employs his secret technique. He brushes Tota and literally pulls little bro's heart out of his body. He then crushes it. Cold-blooded. Usually this is more than enough to eliminate any immortal. But then a dark purple aura emanates from Tota's body. It crushes Kaido's hand and heals Tota expeditiously. Nagumo recognizes the power and calls it the Magia Arabia. Sounds like a coffee brand. Apparently Magia Arabia Dark Magic holds the ultimate secrets of immortality. It is an extraordinary power that can consume your soul. Only two people in existence have this ability. Evangeline is one and the second is the greatest mage in the world. Nagumo fought them back in 2065, and that's when he learned this side is nothing to play with. Tota Choke slams Kaido like a ragdoll while under the influence of this power. Nagumo wants to interfere saying that negative emotions are increasing Tota's crazy power. But Karen says hold your blind horses. Tota is the UQ holder's responsibility, and they will stop him, not some blind grandpa. Tota is about to end Kaido, but he forces himself to take back control over his own body. Kaido can't believe how strong Tota is and begs him to end him. But Tota tells him to shut his suicidal mouth. Tota and Kaido are both weakened, but agree to settle their battle with arm wrestling. Kaido teaches Tota his secret technique, and they wrestle strength against strength. They have an emo chat about feelings, poverty, and abuse of wealth and power. Then Tota smashes Kaido through the ground, winning. Karen realizes she's been underestimating Tota. Nagumo jumps down and is about to take Kaido with him, saying they've earned their pay. The slum is burned down. That's when a voice above them chants an ice spell. It's Yukiheim who saves the slum. Surprisingly, Nagumo and Yukiheim are acquainted. Just when we think the battle is back on, Nagumo unsheathes his sword, slices open a portal and grabs Kaido and escapes. A little later Tota asks Yukihimi what the heck is really good with him and his Arabian coffee powers. Yukihimi nonchalantly replies that he's her red foam baby and that's what makes him extra special. While they rejoice in their victory, through a drone a stranger watches them. Back at the resort, Karamaru and the sword Kurobo are having a chat about the Magia Arabia. Then Kurobo states he knows that Karamaru is in love with Tota. Stunned Kuramaru denies and stabs Kurobo into the earth before running away. We see Shinobu and Tota surfing the sea in some kind of homemade jet ski. Shinobu wants to enter the solar race. One day, Tota is impressed by her mechanical skills and praises her while Kuramaru watches them from a distance like a jealous perv. Later Kuramaru takes a shower and contemplates their feelings. Karen opens the door without knocking and gets a glimpse of Kuramaru's naked body. We discover he is a she. But Kuramaru starts to explain that as a demi-human, her clan has a rare trait. They are genderless or non-binary, and only decide at 16 during a special ceremony. Now that she knows their secret, Karen does something crazy. She attacks, demanding Kuramaru choose a female so that she can spend her life with Tota and he can stay far away from Yukiheim. Karen, you have issues. Karen keeps attacking, 
stating she knows that Karamaru loves Tota. She adds that Karamaru will make a pretty girl. That's when Iku intervenes. He heard everything but will stay mum and also wants to help. Ika's plan is that Karamaru dates Tota, dress up like a pretty girl and go blonde, as they have more fun. Tota is dusting and wondering just where Karamaru got to when she appears. As a beautiful blonde named Kuryu, she pretends to be her own cousin and asks him for a tour. Iku and Karen eavesdrop and are overjoyed that their plan worked. Sucks for Iku though, because he has to do the job Karen had for Karamaru. Tota and Kuryu head over to Shinobu and ask to borrow her jet ski. Shinobu sees them off and they surf to the capital. Karamaru is pleased to have some alone time with Tota. After all, he has as much riz as his grandpa. In the capital, Karamaru asks to visit the tower and Tota agrees. Unbeknownst to them, some knife-licking weirdo has been stalking them. Also, the platinum-haired man who had been spying through the drone has just been informed that Tota is at the capital. So he heads there too. Tota brings Kuryu to the tower and Lil Bro is gushing with excitement. Finally, his tower obsession has become a reality, but he still needs to reach the top so that Ghost can stop haunting him. As they chat, Tota shares some of his past and also his love for Karamaru as his bestie for life. This confuses Karamaru, who wonders if Tota only wants him as a bro. Tota is so enthusiastic so Kuryu risks asking if he's attracted to women. He compliments her leaving her even more confused. Should she be a girl or a guy for Tota? Out of nowhere the stalker emerges. It's Pervy Chow. Back to cause chaos and accompanied by another shadow mage named Azura. Tota gets pulled into the shadow realm while Karamaru is unable to gather. Her chi so she's knocked to the ground. Apparently being disguised as a girl makes you weak sauce. The baddies reveal they were just supposed to track Tota, but Chow is a doofus so he decides that kidnapping is more fun. Karamaru charges the two, attempting to stop them and they realize that she's immortal too. Azura Sparta kicks her out a window. Damned! Azura follows her down and Fruit ninjas her quickly. Chow decides to kidnap her into the Shadow Realm too. As she sinks Karamaru takes off his disguise and regains his full strength. He sends Chow flying rescues the unconscious Tota while Azura runs because the cops are coming. Tota comes to ask about Kuryu. Karamaru lies like his life depends on it. Tota thanks Karamaru for saving him saying he's hopeless without him. Karamaru decides that no matter the gender they choose, they'll always stay with Tota. Back at the resort, a UQ holder, Kiri Sakurami, is performing a ritual repeatedly. When Iku asks her what's it all about, she mysteriously says it starts now. Tota and Karamaru make their way back and are met by Iku, Kiri, and Karen. Tota recognizes Kiri as the lolly who was playing with Sand earlier. Iku informs him that Kiri might look just like a lolly, but she's a powerhouse. Kiri asks Tota for a private chat and immediately starts to reprimand him for his negligence. This girl is spicy and kinda kinky, demanding he sit and bark in other weird orders. Tota's not having it so he spins her like a roulette wheel and demands to know what's up. She states he has repeatedly failed to protect her. Tota is dumbfounded and just before she can explain the shadow mage slices her pretty little neck. Tota is about to chase him but Kiri asks him to hold her hand. He does and they pop back in time. They return to the tree where Kiri was performing her ritual. Kiri explains she turned back time. Then Iku and Karen show up confused asking about Karamaru. Tota is about to reveal that Kiri can turn back time, but she stomps him to silence him. She asks Iku and Karen to take them to the capital. Kiri explains to Tota that her powers are not magic. She explains that it's a special ability she has. The sand mounds are her save points, and she can return to them as long as the fame keeps burning. If she touches someone, she can bring them back too. She's UQ holder number 9, Kiri Sakurami. Few know the nature of her true powers. Kiri says they've been through seven time loops already and Tota has failed each time. She quickly tells us all that has occurred in each time loop, and while speaking Tota spots Sneaky Chow about to attack and sends him flying with a slash from Korobu. Kiri then tells Tota of a kidnapping plot against him made by the greatest mage of all, Fate Avaruncus. We get a flashback of Kiri chatting to Karamaru followed by an explosion at the tower. 
Karamaru runs to the scene, and we see Fate Avaruncus is basically Thanos, and is choking Toda and simultaneously fighting the rest. His fighting technique is off the wall. He enchants Kiri, and tells her that he is the legal owner of Toda, and he is taking his property. We still own people in 2024? Okay. Fate is Mr. Platinum who's been spying. His enchantment is petrification and Kiri realizes that if she is petrified, she won't end, so she ends herself in order to reset time again. Gangster movie. Toda is stunned. He needs to know who Fate is. Kiri doesn't know much except that he is an overpowered earth magic user who used to be a hero, but now he hates humans. Can't say I blame him. Next he asks how the heck does that man own him, but Kiri knows nothing. While they scream at each other, Iku and Karen pop up. They've heard everything and know now what Kiri's powers are. Kiri has kept everything a secret to protect her weakness. Toda assures her that none of them would ever hurt her intentionally. Iku, Karen, and the rest assure her of her safety. Now that everybody trusts each other, Kiri explains Yukaheim's plan of capturing fate. Since they know where and when he'll attack, they just have to get him flustered to overpower him. Toda is the bait and decoy. While Karen and Iku are the defense and diversion, Karamaru and Kiri will be waiting for an opportunity for Kiri to touch Fate. Just one touch will assure them of victory. She plans on returning with Fate to a cave under their headquarters. She informs them she can choose her respawn site and the cave is the best bet to delay and confuse Fate. The whole crew want to join Kiri on her time-traveling teleportation mission and she accepts. They just need to touch her before she leaves with Fate. And the plan is a go. The team communicates via earbuds and smartphone. Toda asks Kiri why Yuki Himi isn't helping them as it's her plan. Kiri explains that fate will feel her energy and their surprise attack will no longer be a surprise. While speaking a figure in a hoodie suddenly walks right into Toda bumping him. But Toda ignores it and instead tries to Google fate. That's when a video of Yuki Himi pops up explaining who and what fate is. Girl you hacked his phone? Apparently Fate Avaruncus saved the world some 80 years ago. Grandpa Negi was there too. They were besties until Toda's grandpa passed away. Then Fate got sick of humans and became a threat. Yukiheim says that Fate wants Toda because of his connection to Negi. She also says that Toda shouldn't believe a word that Fate says. You're kinda Seuss Yukiheim. Suddenly Fate appears as if out of thin air. Just when the crew want to electrify his life, Toda spots his boys from the country just behind Fate. They call off the attack, but Fate has already spotted him. Toda bravely awaits his literal fate. But his boys spot him too and come running over. Seeing the distance now between Fate and Toda and his friends, Iku figures he can fire the laser. But at the point of activation, he is fruit ninjaed by a blue-haired babe. The trio chat until both the friend's shoulders are grabbed from behind. Toda is sweating bullets, but Fate butts in and very politely introduces himself as Toda's grandfather's bestie. His boys get excited and rush to introduce themselves, but Fate already knows who they are. He politely greets them by their names, Nakumaru Tanaka and Toru Mihashi. Fate takes the friends as hostages and requests that Toda join them, or else he'll have to eliminate every single person around them to dust. Toda has no choice but to agree. Fate then calmly tells him to inform his crew, and they too should surrender. But then Fate makes the mistake of calling Yukiheim a two-faced sneaky trickster female dog, and Toda loses it. He summons his gravity blade and starts screaming terrorist, bomb, someone please call 911. This wild Wyclef gene-inspired antic is enough of a distraction for Karen to pounce behind Fate and attack. Of course he blocks her easily, but it's enough for the boys to escape. Toda and Karen both charge him, but with a soft sweet smile fate blocks them. His smile enrages Toda, who supercharges his sword to weigh times 500,000. With this he breaks through fate's barrier. This distracts the blue-haired assassin, allowing Iku to break free and launch the laser. Somehow fate blocks it with another barrier. Then Karamura fingers Kiri towards fate. This is getting intense. She clings tightly to fate, and waits a few seconds for the rest of the crew to join them. Big mistake. Fate immediately petrified her. He teases them saying this is exactly the type of dumb shite he expects from Yukiheim. In the meantime, Iku repeatedly fires the laser as cover fire for an escape. Stupidly, 
Toda wants to fight fate one-on-one -on -one to prove that fate isn't all evil and still has some humanity left. Before Karen can stop the stupidity, Shaba, a mercenary on fate's crew, attacks her. Six-armed Azura is also team fate and fighting against Karamaru. He makes some transphobic jokes and then they get into it. Blue-haired babe introduces herself as Iwai to Iku and says let's get this party started. And it's a free-for-all, with fights as far as you can see. Karen knows they are outmatched but have no room to retreat. With all civilians evacuating, Toda uses the opportunity to flash Step Fate, who hilariously sends him flying. He then motivates Toda into using his sword by shooting a thousand swords at him. Toda evades them all, losing his shirt in the process. But Fate teases him saying his grandpa was a better swordsman at 10 years old. This is when Toda realizes that Fate is a powerhouse, a magical martial artist. He decides to fight him head-on, using the power of his sword to switch from heavy to light with each strike. It's a beautiful battle, and he even manages to slash Fate's face. That's when Karen calls him, informing him of numbers counting down on Kiri's arm. He figures that Kiri is still helping them even though she's a stone statue. They have to keep fighting till the timer reaches zero. Toda taunts Fate into hand-to-hand -hand combat and starts getting slapped all over till he slaps him right back to Kiri, who had been working on a petrification cure. The crew all grab a hold of Kiri and snap. We are now in the 10th playthrough. Fate and our crew find themselves deep in the basement. Yukiheim is there too, and she teases him for being fooled by a group of children. This irritates Fate, and he says come at me dog. He powers up but realizes even if he beats Yukiheim, he'll still have to battle four other immortals. So to make things spicy and mess with our crew Fate offers them a deal. Release him, and he'll answer any question they have. Shitty deal, but okay. Toda being an impulsive monkey brain rushes forward, but luckily Karen knocks sense into him. He should ask last, that way he'll hear all their questions answered, and know what to ask. When Ika starts, he asks Fate what the heck he wants with Toda. Why is a grown man so obsessed with a child? It's a perv. Fate tells us he needs Toda to help save Negi. Seems Yukiheim has been lying when she said the old man kicked the bucket 20 years ago. Karen steps up to ask next. She asks who did Negi love more, Fate or Yukiheim? Jesus Karen, you are obsessed. Fate is flabbergasted and Yukiheim starts sending icicles his way so he chooses to answer indirectly. Then it's Karamura's turn. They ask Fate if Toda has to leave immediately to help him, but he says no, it's not urgent. There's no rush yet. Now it's Toda's turn. He wants to know if Fate offered his parents and Fate says yes. Toda doesn't hesitate but immediately goes black armed psycho mode. That's when a charm activates on Toda's back and a telecommunication portal opens and Negi pops up. What the hell? It's a live communication. Negi starts chatting away but Yukihimi uses telepathy to order Karamaru to find the charm on Toda's body that's allowing him to communicate with Negi and destroy it. Karamura does as orders, just when Negi is about to reveal some secrets. Yukiheim seems to be hiding something big from Toda, typical female. Fate is released, and everything seems to go back to normal. Except for Kiri who is pissed to be excluded from all the drama. Next we see Toda who demands answers from Yukiheim. But she ignores him and rushes to her office and locks the door. Susaf. A little later a granny and an overexcited blonde girl show up to the resort asking for Yukiheim and Toda. Toda is enjoying a snack prepared by Shinobu, while Kiri and Karamurk spy on them. When that same new blonde girl just barges in, interrupting and intimidating. Her name is Yukihiro. She comes in screeching that Toda is last in line in a family of seti lady killers. Women have always loved Springfield men. Yukihiro's great-grandma was one of Negi's Huchis. Yukihiro is flying the feminist fag ready to ensure no other girls fall for a sprinkled boy. She attacks Toda and spins him like a wheel but his quick reflexes send her flying through the sky. He rushes to save her from her own destruction. Him saving her makes her love struck. After he safely sets her on the roof, she jumps from his arms and makes her intentions known. She proposes, while actually insists that Toda become her bridegroom from that day. Toda immediately declines saying I don't even know you bro. We spot Yukiheim and the granny enjoying a tea and a chat. They reminisce back to when Toda's grandpa had all the girls slobbering over him. 
Yukiheim and the granny went to the same school and granny was as obsessive then as her great-granddaughter is now. And just like her great-grandma, Yukihiro also knows the way to a man's heart is through his tummy. She gets to cooking while the rest of the girls all spy angrily from a distance. Kiri and the rest analyze their competition, miss the new girl, and seem distraught. Kiri even falls to her knees in despair, but still won't admit that she too loves Tota. Karen tells the rest that human girls are confident and assertive because they have no time to waste, and that's their advantage over immortal girls. This information further destroys Kiri as she realizes her chance of winning Tota's heart is slim to none. Iku pops up, calling himself the guardian of lovestruck maidens, and offers a solution to their problem. His solution? Netflix and chill. Just kidding, it's hot springs and chill. Plus 50 back rubs is the key to success. Kiri, Karen, and Karamaru aren't really interested, so Iku threatens to tell the human girls about the magical back rub shenanigans. Yukihiro's great-grandma and Yukiheim continue to discuss Negi and the present situation. They both revert to their youthful state and have a deep and emo conversation about fear and letting go and being brave. It ends with a quote from Negi stating, A little courage is true magic. Toda and Iku are chilling in the hot spring. We get some of Iku's backstory, he's technically 13 but legally 85. While he tells his backstory, he admits that he's wasting time waiting to see which girl will be courageous enough to come and scrub Tota's back. The girls are nervous and contemplating when out pops Karen, surprising Iku. Who would have guessed that Karen wants some Mac love? She quickly says she is just there to watch, but brings out a broom and pins Tota to a stone. She harshly starts to scrub his back. Then Kiri shows up and Fly kicks her. She accuses Karen of loving him too. While she argues with Karen, Shinobu is scrubbing away. But Yukihiro bum rushes her, and it becomes a battle of the babes. They're almost scrubbing his skin off. Luckily Karamaru flies in and grabs Tota from these raging females' clutches. They all chase after them and it's a comical commotion that sends Tota flying and the girls pulling each other's towels and hair fighting tooth and nail for the opportunity. But sneaky Yukiheim arrives while the others fight, and she scrubs Tota's back. Our girl fighters watch angrily from a distance. Iku admits to being a liar, liar pants on fire, and gets chased off. A bit later, Yukihiro and Shinobu discuss their feelings for Tota. Yukihiro says she's trained to be with Tota, but she'll go easy on Shinobu cause she's weak. Kiri watches them, and plots from a distance. That night, Tota meets Yukiheim at the waterside. Yukiheim looks like a kid and Tota asks why the childish appearance? Yukiheim says she'd rather look like a kid when sharing her secret with him. Weird. Tota, looking FY in a suit, interrupts her and asks if she used to love his pappy Negi. Yukiheim admits her grandpa fetish, which continues to this day. She gets sad and says that the Negi they spoke to is not the Negi she knows and loves. Apparently 20 years ago Negi defeated an evil mage. The mage named Bauth is called Life Maker and the Mage of Beginning. She has a special ability enabling her to steal the bodies of whoever defeats her, making her undying. Simply put, Negi's body has been possessed for the past 20 years. Fate and Yukiheim plotted to save him, but in different ways, and this caused their separation. Tota then asks Yukiheim just what Negi was trying to tell him before she broke the connection. She then drops the bombshell that Tota is Negi's clone. Surprise! Tota is just about as shocked as we are. Flabbergasted, he shares the news with Kuramaru. Their conversation gets deep as he bares his soul. Then Yukihiro busts in and tells Tota it's time to go to the Mahora Martial Arts Tournament. Tota's never heard of it, but it's a good distraction from life, changing news that's been thrust upon him. They arrive at the tournament and Tota is freaking hyped AF. Yukihiro gives him the rundown on this immortal magical smackdown. Tota immediately wants to join the fray. He rushes to find a staff member who says no sorry bro, all participants are pre-selected. Only if a participant were to drop out then he can fill their spot. Depressed, Tota decides to enter next year, giving him more time to train. Tota and Yukihiro look over the crowd and chat further when her great-grandma, Ayaka, rolls up. Her personal assistant Shikimaru accompanies her, as well as the director of the tournament and headmistress of the school, Mana. Mana is quick to inform Tota that his grandpa Negi was a teacher at the school 80 years ago. 
Ayaka, Shikimaru, and Mana used to be his students, and his harem girls. Wheelchair Lady tells Yukihiro that she's borrowing Tota for a bit. Back at the headquarters, Shinobu is hard at work when she discovers that everyone has left for the capital, so she skips work to join them. Wheelchair Lady and her harem crew bring Tota to his grandpa's classroom. Apparently grandpa started teaching at age 10. The hell? Then another harem girl pops up. Sayo? I think she's a ghost. Anyway, Kiri and Karamaru finally catch up with Yukihiro who is flipping out at the thought that her grandma may be putting the moves on Tota. Yukihiro gets a mental breakdown at the thought of Granny getting it in with her darling Tota. Back in the classroom, Ayaka suddenly regains the strength to walk and starts cozying up to Tota. They all know he is Negi's clone and compliment and appreciate Tota and start squeezing him tight and cuddling him and touching his body. Weird old women. Luckily a phone call interrupts the perversion, Mana quickly answers and hears that some contestants have been injured and a replacement is needed. Luckily she knows just the right person. The Mahora Martial Arts Tournament is about to start. The first person to enter the ring is our 14-year-old immortal friend. Karamaru and Kiri are quick to ask Yukihiro if she's behind the injured ex-contestants, but she denies this. Next Tota's opponent is introduced. Dude is super mysterious. The announcer knows nothing about him except his name, Cutlass. Super SUS. Tota notices something familiar about the mysterious stranger. And they're off. Tota charges head first at the hooded figure, who easily dodges his attack. Cutlass is uber powerful, and at first Tota is ecstatic to be battling someone so strong. Tota is under the impression that it's just his lucky day, but Cutlass smirks and calls Tota his clueless bumbling brother. What? Then Cutlass starts attacking full force. The ferocity of the battle alerts the Granny Harem crew that something is off, while Karamaru also starts questioning what the heck is really good. At the hospital, Mana is questioning the injured parties as the match plays on TV. That's when one of the participants shouts out that Cutlass was the one who attacked them. Something's fishy. The battle intensifies, and Tota is getting pimp slapped all over the arena. Cutlass calls Tota a cheap inferior copy and conjures up a casting circle before slicing Tota from the shoulder to the groin. Gosh, it's explicit and thick red foam sprays everywhere. Yukihiro and Kiri demand Karamaru intervene to do something about the fight, but Karamaru says that's impossible as a powerful, impenetrable barrier surrounds the arena. Tota literally pulls himself back together and activates his coffee Arabica ability. Cutlass insults him grimly and conjures up another sword, calling him brother while slicing and dicing him. He then conjures up several metal rods that impale Tota, pinning him to the ground. Now immobile, Cutlass cruelly inflicts intense emotional damage, verbally destroying Tota. The crowd is silent when suddenly Tota's friends start encouraging and motivating him to kick that blonde baddie's butt. Their support gives Tota the strength to stand up against the blonde. Bully and even free his left arm which he uses to pimp smack Cutlass. The force knocks their hoodie off and it's revealed that Cutlass is a girly. Cutlass says she'd love to end Tota but she's just the opening act. Someone starts materializing behind Cutlass. Surprise it's Grandpa Negi, looking devilishly handsome and a tad bit evil. The Granny Harem crew immediately get excited at the thought of Negi, who is not actually Negi standing below them. Calm down grannies. Mana immediately realizes that the mage has come for Tota. Negi tells Tota that he has come for him as he is the only one who can save the world. But Tota is no fool and calls bullshit saying that if Negi's words were true why is he only popping up now? Negi reveals that Tota had been hidden from him and that's why he had sent ghostly visions of himself across the world that only members of his bloodline could see, hoping they would return to him. Negi says Yukiheim hid Tota from him and calls her his master. Oh my god. That's when Yukiheim destroys the barrier with a powerful spell and stands in front of Tota like a true G. Yukihimi refuses to acknowledge Negi but calls him mage of the beginning, Bauth. Bauth uses magic to bind Yukiheim as three other baddies join the party. To balance things Karen, Karamaru, and Kiri pop up to support Yukiheim and Tota. It's about to go down. Yukiheim alerts the UQ holders that this will not be an easy feat. Bauth and her team will be hard to beat. There's you, the magical detective, Nodoka, an all-seeing mind reader. Jack Rockin, 
the strongest overpowered mercenary swordsman, and of course Grandpa Negi, the most powerful of them all. That's when Negi sneezes and everyone's clothes go flying. Everyone, even the spectators. It's a sight to behold. His pervert ability reminds us all just how powerful Negi truly is. This is also the moment Shinobu arrives at the stadium. Meanwhile, Kiri attempts to negotiate, but Nodoka easily reads her mind and foils her plan. Then Nodoka and you try to convince Toda to join them without resistance as he is the only successful clone creation. They have failed more than 71 times when trying to combine Negi and Asuna's powers. Toda of course refuses when an ominous voice echoes around them. A portal opens behind them and teleports Toda and Yukiheim. She passes out and as he rushes towards her, he finds himself in another era. A stranger introduces himself as Kunal Sanders, like the guy from KFC, but Kurobo corrects him and says the guy's real name is Albirio Emma. He's the powerful mage who created Kurobo. Kurobo warns that Sanders is an evil demon. This angers the mage who punishes Kurubo by torturing him in several cruel ways. Sanders then tells Toda that he used to be homies with Yukiheim, but he is now helping Negi. His mission is to convince Toda to join them, and the best way he knows how is to show us Yukiheim's backstory. It's a love story. We see how Yukiheim met Nagi, Negi's father, and fell head over heels. She's basically an obsessed stalker. Time passes, 15 years actually and Yukiheim meets Nagi's son at the Mahora Academy. Soon she starts training him, while she makes explicit kinky demands of him under the guise of training. Luckily Asuna rescues him from her perversions. Damn Yukiheim, what's wrong with you? Apparently she trained him well but Yukiheim is a nasty freak who took full advantage of a 10-year-old boy. This also explains why he keeps calling her master. Toda thanks Sanders for the flashback. But Sanders says this is not the past. What? Yukiheim somehow sees and recognizes Toda, and that's when Bauth makes her grand entrance and binds Yukiheim. Before Toda can react he is impaled by several spears courtesy of Sanders. Bauth tear Yukiheim in two and dashes her to the ground. Toda is also slammed to the ground, battered as he crawls toward Yukiheim. Yukiheim is red foaming all over and Bauth warns the only way to save Yukiheim is to belong to Bauth. Why are these old women so obsessed with young boys? Disgusting. Toda grabs Yukiheim's hand, and she pulls herself together. He carries her in his arms. Yukihimi cries and confesses that Toda is the one she has always wanted. Bro what the heck? You were like a mom to him. Diabolical. She says all she ever wanted was somebody to love. He is a child, Yukiheim. Toda reassures Yukiheim that he is the one for her. She's 700 and you're 14 Browski. Gross brother. Bouth say this sick shite will never work and Yukihimi will never be happy. I agree. But Toda jumps to her defense telling Bouth to watch her mouth. And he is coming for her. Bouth says bring it on silly boy and attacks. Toda dodges every attack with Yukihime in his arms. Seems Bouth is unbeatable. That's when. Yukihime tells Toda that they are in a dimension created in both minds and she has full control. Anything she imagines will occur. Luckily Yukihime knows a way to fight it. She conjures a powerful spell that allows them to use their powers and strength to fight back. Yukihime confidently says if they break Bouth's mind in this dimension, they will end her. They bum rush her, but she quickly conjures up holograms of Nagi and Negi flabbergasting Yukihime. Toda interrupts the illusion and both get knocked to the ground by a power javelin. Yukiheim gets a nosebleed and accidentally lets it slip that she has only loved three men in her 700-year life. Father, son, and great-grandson. What is immortal hillbilly behavior? The fight continues, and I'm on Bouth's side. WTF Yukiheim. She conjures a powerful spell that looks like a spirit bomb, but Bouth is unfazed. The Negi hologram power punches Toda into the sea and holograms of Karen and all the other girlies drag him under. He knows that it's not real but he can't fight back. Suddenly Asuna pops up and with one strike of her sword destroys the illusion. She kindly introduces herself and Toda finally understands that she's his granny. Yukiheim is stunned to see Asuna as she had sacrificed herself on Mars. What in the plot twist madness is going on? Asuna says her real body is asleep on Mars. Apparently she popped up out of Toda due to Bouth twisting his consciousness.
Asuna joyfully hugs Yukiheim as it's been ages since they last saw each other. Karen and the harem crew are there too. Balth try to tentacle attack them, but Asuna blocks that easily. She warns them that only 0.7 seconds has passed in reality. And as soon as she frees them, their real fight will begin. She clues everyone in on the weaknesses of Negi's crew, and also informs Tota that the power inside of him is the only thing that can truly destroy Balth. To activate that power, 37 seconds are needed. Asuna slices through the mind dimension to let the team back into the real world so that the battle can begin. Karen and Kiri battle Jack, whose overconfidence makes him vulnerable on the first strike, so they fire blast and fast him into submission. Yukiheim goes after Cutlass, freezing her up in an ice block. Karamaru replicates themselves and then binds Nodoka and Yu. Tota activates Coffee Arabica while charging Negi but the attack is easily avoided. Negi still tries to convince Tota to join him, but Tota's only focus is freeing his pawpaw. The UQ holders continue fighting Negi's crew. Their goal is to distract their opponents until Tota can activate his hidden power. Unfortunately, Negi is almost invincible, and just as he is about to overpower Tota, fate arrives. Fate joins Yukiheim in subduing Negi. Fate forms a barrier over them, and somehow pulls their souls above their bodies. Grandpa Negi is now free to plan his escape with them. Fate is quick to tell Negi that he has found a way to free Negi once, and for all and Tota is the key. Fate plans on turning all of humanity immortal, which will drain Balth's power. But Negi calmly reminds them all that he and Balth are now one, so they'll have to end them both. Fate freaks, deeply saddened. Negi then wants to share his last few moments with Tota, but he stops him. He says Negi should spend his last moments with his perverted master, Yukiheim. Yukiheim files into Negi's embrace crooning sweet nothings to the young grandpa. This anime is weird bro. Negi looks at Tota, admiring his grandson, and just when he is about to share something with him the connection breaks. They re-enter their bodies and fate petrified while Yukiheim freezes him. But he busts through it like the cool aid man, glowing palely. He attacks them simultaneously with glowing spears of light. The 37 seconds are over and Tota glows just like Negi. Power activated. Meanwhile, Karamaru and Karen are being pimp slapped all over the arena. It's freaking brutal, bro. Tota feels in his overpowered state with Negi right behind him. In the sky they fight. Negi is whooping that but all over. Even destroying the tower with their shenanigans. Tota gets worked into a frenzy and punches his paw paw full force while lecturing and levitating. Tota promises to save them all and in that moment he has the upper hand. Until Jack pops up and runs his giant black weapon right through Tota. He falls back into the arena impaled. It's a sad sight. What's worse is that all the UQ members are just as messed up as Tota. Negi says goodbye and fingers his spear at Tota's head. That's when sweet little Kiri stands as a human shield. She taunts Negi, reminding him of her ability. Negi walks over and teases Kiri for her love of Tota, which she denies. While still denying you and Nodoka read her mind, she becomes a river in Egypt. That's when Cutlass slices through her shoulder, torturing her while red foam sprays. Tota freaks and struggles to free himself. But Kiri starts laughing ecstatically. She reminds him that the time has come to enact their plan. Casting circles appear, and everyone is teleported 80 years into the past. Negi's schoolgirl harem awaits, and they fire magic sealing bullets at him. They bind him, and attacks come from all sides from all the girls present. They also compliment and remind him of their love. What love bombing domestic violence Taknajutsu madness is going on? Negi gets sick of the insanity and attacks back, but his attacks are blocked and defected while the madness continues. Turns out it was part of a diversion, so that they can inject Negi with green goo to weaken him. Negi is flabbergasted and so are we. Apparently all these girls have been waiting inside Tota and have now taken form. Somehow they all mix their DNA with Negi to create Tota. What is the chromosomal abnormality? Basically he is their baby. Negi says it's absurd and I completely agree. Then Asuna shows up and reminds Negi they have always been absurd and he has always wanted to protect them. Suddenly, they teleport back to the arena and Asuna cuddles Negi lovingly. Rose petals fall, and an emo conversation is had. Balth takes over again and tells Asuna that they'll withdraw for now. 
Negi then lets Toda know that he'll be waiting at the top of the tower then a blinding light shoots out and takes Negi and his crew away. The UQ holders are alone in the completely destroyed arena. Luckily, not a single person perished as the other UQ holders were able to save them and transport them to safety. Fate and Yukiheim agree that the battle is not over, but Fate warns that he'll use his own methods to save Negi and expects them to not interfere. He then instantly transmits himself away. Toda stares at the tower and says, Wait for me, Papa, I'll be coming for you. Back at the headquarters, as Toda's harem discusses the events that have transpired, Kiri still insists that she feels absolutely nothing for Toda. Behind them, we spot Toda heading to Yukiheim's office. He barges in and declares his love for her. Brother Ugg. She punches him and sends him flying, but Toda rushes back. Yukiheim blushes deeply, and then Toda gives a pretty romantic speech before he proposes. Brother what? Brother no. Luckily, the 700-year-old pervert says no. Toda's faber is gassed, and then Karen and the rest of his harem attack him in jealousy. As they chase after Toda, Yukiheim smiles to herself, blushing deeply. She says that that foolish child is 500 years too late. No shit Yukiheim, he is 14. And that's the end of this insane anime. It started gory but great then towards the end things got seriously insane, diabolical and twisted. I mean love affairs between immortals and 10 year olds is not something I thought I would be watching. Never mind falling for his grandson after. What in the perverse madness was that all about? And it ends on a cliffhanger with no follow-up season in sight. Wow. Just wow. My flabber is gassed too. I'm going to touch some grass. I hope you do too. This is your Anime Sensei signing off.